And I don't intend to be preaching sermons from this day moving forward. I intend to be preaching sirens because we need to sound the alarm about what's happening in our world. And over the past 21 days, as I'm looking at the very next text that we're in, Daniel chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to turn there in advance. If you have our app, all of our sermon notes are there for you as well. I'm looking at these pieces to this prophetic puzzle, and perhaps it's worth saying that this is one of the most complicated chapters to teach in all the Bible. Because of the specificity and the details of this prophecy, there are over 135, they say, pieces that are fulfilled as we look back in human history, it's remarkable that this chapter has found its full fulfillment except for the last part of the chapter, which is like a transfer of time into the end time scenario. And you'll understand what that means once we get there. But it's important to note that I'm going to provide developments about this historical context, not the details that it lends itself to. If you're interested in history and you're a history buff, I would love to provide you with commentaries that break down such details to this chapter, it will blow your mind. We don't have enough time to do that. So what I wanna do is look at some of the pieces that are gonna help us understand our current and present context. So why should there be a sense of urgency today. Well, with so many moving parts in our world, it's hard to even keep up. There's new things happening and developing on the global level, on the local level, and everywhere in between. And as you're seeing these things unfold, the Christian has to have a spiritual context for everything. We have to have discernment to know the difference between good and evil, truth and lies, light and darkness, and we have to be willing to stand for the truth for such a time as this. And the word of God gives us the ammunition or the weaponry or the armor. It's spiritual. Ephesians 6 tells us we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. But in the heavenly realm, there's this war that is raging. And in Daniel chapter 10, we get to see behind the veil. And we get to see the prince of Persia and then a mentioning of the prince of Greece at a time where these world empires were dominating the known world and many of them were adversarial towards little old Israel, the people of God. Now, understand this, every prophecy in the Bible hinges upon Israel. Okay, so I should keep an eye on Israel and what's happening in the Middle East. And the reason why we, in the American context, should be interested is because we are the only country that has stood by Israel for the past several decades. So based on what we do, it's gonna affect what Israel does and vice versa. So that's why it's important. Okay, that was not getting patriotic. That was getting actually very biblical in case anybody misunderstands the difference between the two. So we come back to this grounding that is in the word of God, understanding that we are the church of Jesus Christ and the word of God needs to be my armor and the word of God is what defends my life. But it also is what defines our times. So the word of God is like a lens that I look through and gives me a spiritual context. So what do we have to come back to? I'll tell you. Too many people are in the church but not of the church. Huge difference between the two. My testimony is a microcosm that lends itself to say, I was in the church, but I was not of the church my entire young life. I was in the pew, or I would say, I held my Bible, but I never allowed the Bible to hold me. I would say, I came to church, but did I really come to Christ? I don't know that. When I look back in hindsight, I go, I was not a young man with conviction. I was straddling the proverbial fence. So I have to go through this If I think I'm going to heaven, but heaven doesn't influence the way I'm thinking, then I need to rethink that thought. If I think that I'm going to heaven because I come to church, but heaven does not influence the way I think, then I need to rethink that thought. So if you have come to Christ, here's what happens. You are salvaged by the atonement of the Son of God. Step number one. Do you believe that? Your sins are forgiven forever, freely, and finally. The atonement of the Son of God. 
But God's not done with you yet. Because after you come to Christ, guess what? You become adopted into the family of God. You are now a child of the most high God. But he's not done with you yet because he's not gonna leave you alone. You now have an advocate in the spirit of God. The atonement paid by the son of God, adopted into the family of God. You have the advocacy of the Holy Spirit of God. And finally, what is my role and goal on planet earth? You are now an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And as an ambassador, you represent an entirely different sovereign than the one that would govern your land. You respo you're responsible for the rights and responsibilities as a citizen of heaven, sent forth as an ambassador to represent your king's throne. And as an ambassador, guess what you come with? The authority of your king, the authority of your sovereign. And as an ambassador, guess what I have in foreign territory? Diplomatic immunity. I'm not to conform to the customs or laws of the land when they contradict the word of God. And I'm not to worry about the consequences when those customs and laws of the land contradict the word of God. Because like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3, and like Daniel in chapter 6, I'm not going to bow down to the mandates around me because I'm going to respond to the mandates that heaven has provided for me. We have to know the times we're living in. Daniel chapter 11, verse two is a continuation from Daniel chapter 10. Daniel was praying and fasting for 21 days. The angel Gabriel shows up on the 21st day, tells him upon the first day he summoned God, petitioned, his prayer was heard. The angel tells him there was a battle in the heavenlies that has delayed his arrival with the answer. Daniel is basically humbled. He's uh, uh, unconscious at this particular point. He's given a vision, which is what we're gonna look at in Daniel 11. It's a very explicit and detailed prophetic vision about what would happen for the next 500 years from the time of Daniel's life. Okay, they're at the 70th year, Daniel, in captivity in Babylon. Babylon has been swallowed by the Medo-Persian Empire. The main king of Persia is Cyrus. Cyrus executes a decree to set the Jews free. Daniel perhaps is distressed that his countrymen are not returning to their homeland. He's perhaps distressed that they're celebrating what they call Passover, which was a celebration of the deliverance of the Israelites in slavery to Egypt. And yet here they are still in Babylon, still enslaved, perhaps in Babylon and of Babylon. Perhaps he's praying and fasting about the future of his people and what it's gonna look like. Remember, at this point, he's already been given dreams and visions about the future of his people, and it doesn't look good. There's gonna be kingdom after kingdom that rises and falls, all of which will be adversarial against the people of God. Daniel sees a desecration of the temple, and he's distressed. He does not sit on the sidelines and use the excuse, well, this is just God's will be done because that should never be excuse not to do God's will. He engages, he begins to pray, he begins to fast, he begins to enter into the work of God. He's given an angel with a message. We have access to what he's been given more than Daniel all these ages later where we can look back and say, wow, this is amazing. History affirms prophecy. But more than that, prophecy is what forms history. God's word is what forms history. Daniel 11 verse two is a Persia prophecy. Daniel 11 verses three and four is a prophecy about Alexander the Great and the Grecian empire. It's eventual split into four parts. Verses five to 20, very detailed. I will not get into the details. I will get into the developments. It's between the Seleucid dynasty and the Ptolemaic dynasties. Daniel chapter 11 verses 21 to 35 is a prophecy about Antiochus who will come out of the Grecian empire. He's a foreshadow. The hell that he unleashed on the Jews is a foreshadow of the hell that's gonna be unleashed on a Christ rejecting world through the antichrist. So I see him in scripture, I study him in history and I go, he's a type of, he's a picture of, he's a foreshadow too. And the reason why a good Bible student does his due diligence and looks into the scriptures is because what has happened previously is most likely gonna be recycled and happen again. So I'm connecting the prophetic puzzles and the final verses of this chapter will be a prophecy about the eventual antichrist. So it's cool that God gives Daniel prophecies that are future oriented for Daniel, prophecies that are fulfilled for us, 
And then a final unfulfilled prophecy in the Antichrist. It's remarkable. Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And now I will tell you the truth. This is the angel. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia. And the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Okay, you won't remember this, but the three kings from Cyrus that are connected to Cyrus, there were more than three kings in the Persian line. But the three kings that were directly connected to Cyrus through his lineage were Cambyses, Pseudosmyrtus, and a king named Darius Hystaspes. Okay, those names mean absolutely nothing. And that's okay, because we got to go through those three, according to the prophecy, to get to the fourth king. The fourth king, ladies and gentlemen, you will know. His name is Xerxes. Xerxes is depicted in the movie 300. This is when the Persian Empire comes with its great army and they come against the 300 Spartans of Greece. Now, the movie is sensationalized and obviously it's rooted in Greek and Persian mythology, but it's pretty interesting if you've ever seen the movie that they're not far off, that there's a spiritual realm that is actually moving some of these physical upheavals and battles. So if there's ever a physical upheaval, then there's certainly a spiritual battle. Xerxes comes to us in the scriptures under the name King Ahasuerus. You will read about King Ahasuerus, AKA Xerxes, one of the richest kings in the Persian context in the book of Esther. It's remarkable. What was it about King Xerxes? Well, he began to stir up his wealth and his men of war against the realm of Greece. So on the history books, you begin to see these clashes between these two empires. Remarkably, Daniel was given foresight about the Babylonian fall, about the rise of the Medo-Persian empire, and even about some great king that would come out of the Grecian empire. At the time he's given it, Greece is nothing but divided many city-states. So it's so amazing to see how God is able to give us in advance with accuracy and specificity such details to pay attention to. Xerxes or King Hohasuerus, noteworthy because of his time in Persia and the book of Esther. What was it about Esther? Well, the details are remarkable. The story begins with King Ahasuerus having a huge party, 180 days worth of a party. And then of course, after much wine, wanted to show off his queen, Vashti. Vashti refused to come. The king was enraged. He asked his counsel what should be done to the woman, the queen, who disregarded my command. They say, put her out, punish her. So she's excommunicated, amazing because you have a pagan king, a pagan queen, who's now put aside, which leaves a hole for a guy named Mordecai, a Jew, in the Persian context, to present to the king his, we'll call her his niece, Esther. Esther finds favor in this pagan king's court. Esther is given the crown as queen. She is going to be used in this prophetic puzzle to bring favor to God's people because God never leaves himself without a witness, not from Daniel to Nehemiah to Ezra to Esther. God is constantly placing a witness in any given governmental context as the lights and as the representation of hope as his ambassadors. What happens? A man named Haman rises to power, despises Mordecai, wants to destroy this Jew, Mordecai. Now, while that's happening, and he's plotting out how he's going to take Mordecai out, he's going to come to the king. It tells us earlier, Mordecai discovered a plot to eventually assassinate the king. He tells Esther, hey, there's this plot. These eunuchs were attempting to kill King Xerxes. Tell the king. They look into it. They do their investigation. They find out it's true. So they write down this amazing exploit by Mordecai in the book of the Chronicles. On a certain day, there was a man named Mordecai who discovered a plot to kill the king and they write it down. 
Okay, Haman's on his way in with his plot to destroy Mordecai. He doesn't know the night before the king couldn't sleep. God is sovereign. And he woke up and said, I can't sleep. Can somebody read me a story? And they pull from the book of the Chronicles and they read about this one named Mordecai. And the king says, what was done for him? He saved my life. What was done for him? Hey, who's in my court? I want to ask some of my counselors what should be done. Guess who's in the court coming? Haman. Haman walks in and the king says, Haman, hold up. I got a question. What would you intend to do to honor the man who honors the king? Haman thinks the king's talking about himself. So he says, let that man ride on the king's horse. Let that man wear the king's robe. Let that man be paraded through the city streets with the announcement, this is what happens to the one who honors the king. That's what I would do, king, Haman says. He goes off thinking it's him. It's not, it's Mordecai. Mordecai is not only honored by the hands of the man who wanted to kill him. In the meantime, Haman was able to convince the king that the Jews were a threat. Now, mind you, King Xerxes doesn't know that Esther is a Jew. When Mordecai finds out, he tells his niece, hey, and this is the famous line, don't think for one second that if you don't open up your mouth and speak up for the truth and represent your people and be an ambassador for the kingdom of God, that you're gonna be spared. If not you, God will find somebody else to work through. Perhaps you've come to this moment for such a time as this. She goes to the king unannounced. The king gives her favor. She tells the king the plot. The king is furious. Haman's coming in thinking he's gonna get honored. He gets hung on the same gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Are you seeing how God is sovereign, constantly working behind the scenes? You might not see him working. You don't know what he's doing in other people's hearts. You don't know what he's doing to line things up. But when you understand his word and you understand how all of this pans out, God has a plan for his people. The very next threat will come through a man named Antiochus Epiphanes through the Grecian empire. That threat came through the Persian empire. Keep it in mind at every step of this journey, that there's no physical upheaval that is detached from a spiritual battle. It's all spiritual. Who sits on, thr on the throne above all that is spiritual? Okay, let's start at the top. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him, this is Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, that are in heaven, eternal, invisible, spiritual, that are on earth, temporal, physical, visible. Is that your own translation, Pastor? No, let me read you the next two words. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. This was said by the apostle John as well. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. Everything will flow through this sovereign throne that Christ sits upon. And not only all things were created through him, all things were created for him. Think about that. And in him, all things consist. Translation, in him, all things are held together. He holds the world together. And when he decides to take his hands off this world, it will unravel. And if he decides to take his hands off our lives, it will unravel. He is before all things. You know that crisis or tragedy or trial or tribulation or burden that you had to walk through and you didn't see it coming? Yeah, Christ was before that. And it can't touch your life until it goes through the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. And if that love is expressive and demonstrative and sacrificial, if that's the type of love that God has for me, God who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, all things that we would need for life and godliness, all things that we would need for our spiritual well-being, our emotional well-being, and even the things that touch us physically, God has given it as a way to accomplish his divine purpose. Because it's not about how we're doing physically, church, it's about how we're doing spiritually. 
And there's so much emphasis on how we are doing physically and I gotta maintain my physical health and I gotta do whatever I can do to protect myself. And yes and amen, that is not for you to fill in what I did not say and say, are you saying that this isn't real? No, it's extremely real. People have lost their lives, people are getting sick, but none of that can happen outside of the sovereignty of God. Okay. In the case of Job, who was the first one before all that Job went through? Have you considered my servant Job? That was God. Who was the one before all the things Jesus went through? The plan and purpose of the father was to send the son to lay down his life, to subject himself to human hands. Think about the hands, the Romans, the religious leaders, um, in a, you know, What's the word when you live through somebody? Vicariously. Vicariously, our hands pinned him there. And yet Christ subjected himself to human hands. And in case you think I'm making this up, he stood before the one who was the prosecutor, Pontius Pilate, the Roman. And he says to Jesus, why aren't you answering me? You're on trial, not me. Paraphrasing. Don't you know I have the authority to set you free or kill you? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he says this, John 19, 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus stood there going, you have no power. This is supposed to transpire. I've committed myself to my father's will. So you're not even able to act out your own will. You're doing exactly what you are supposed to do. Jesus committed himself. He understood that the greater authority was his father. And if you understand the half of what I just said, comfort and confidence will come to your soul when you know Christ is Lord over all creation, all creatures, every crown, every crisis, every circumstance. And while I'm on a roll with alliteration and C's and even coronavirus. <laughs> Comfort and confidence comes to the soul that knows God is in control. Now that's not gonna be easy. We're gonna wrestle our way through with our faith. I'm gonna struggle, I'm gonna doubt, but I'm gonna remember my God is sovereign. Help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. Verse three and four, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not amongst his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be uprooted, even for others beside these remarkable two verses in the Bible. We have the history books to tell us this is none other than Alexander the Great one of the greatest conquerors to ever conquer. Alexander the Great conquered more of the known world in under such a short period of time. He reigned from approximately 331 to 323 for for nine years. He literally dominated the known world. And if that's true, then why is he only given one verse? Look how quickly we just went over Alexander the Great. Mighty king arises, he shall rule with great dominion. He does according to his will. His kingdom's divided to four. I'll tell you why. He's the only king in the series of kings that we're gonna talk about that wasn't adversarial against Israel. So God's gotta give him no more time because he's gonna deal with those that are adversarial against Israel. And Alexander the Great wasn't. Why wasn't he? He was a bloodthirsty conqueror, I'll tell you why. History tells us, recorded by Josephus, that the high priest at the time in Jerusalem was given a vision. And the vision was of this conqueror named Alexander who was to come and conquer. And guess who else was given a vision? Alexander the Great. And he had a vision of priests wearing white garments. And as he's coming to the edge of Israel, the priest meets him. And here's an exchange between Alexander, who otherwise would give his soldiers complete access to plunder and destroy, overwhelm, take captives and take over. He doesn't. Out of all of that area, Israel is untouched by Alexander the Great. It's because what he said was what he saw in the vision. He believed that there was a sovereign that was greater than even he. And he gave Jerusalem amnesty. 
And you know why? It says the high priest brought to him the scroll of Daniel and showed him where it is written about the rise of Babylon and Persia and you're the king, you're the great king. And he was so moved by that, he spared Jerusalem, but his kingdom was broken up into four parts. That's pretty cool, right? When kingdoms break up, it's sometimes uh, be between two hostile takeovers. But here, the word of the Lord tells us, no, it's gonna be four. It's gonna be divided into four. We've already covered this. It was the belly and thighs of bronze in chapter two in this great statue, this vision and dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Greece is the belly and thighs of bronze. In chapter seven, Greece is the beast like a leopard with four heads. The four heads symbolically point to the four divisions of the kingdom. Greece is the goat in chapter eight with the notable horn. The notable horn is Alexander the Great. And it says the notable horn will be replaced by four horns towards the winds of heaven. See how it's all coming together. What is God doing here? If you have a GPS app and you start out, let's start out pretty high, right? Aerial view. And what you'll notice is, let's go as high as the tri-state area. I would see Pennsylvania, the state, the name on my GPS. You know how you use your hands and you, you scroll out. And there's Jersey, Pennsylvania. You'll see Maryland and Delaware. Now what happens when you begin to zoom in? you begin to see more details on the map. You see within the state of New Jersey, now you see city names. And when you get even closer, you begin to see street names. This is how God has laid out his visions from chapter two all the way to the end of this book. What started out as a panoramic view, world powers that will arise. Let's go through, through them very quickly. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome is gonna come on the scene. We know that, that was the time of Jesus. Rome would eventually fall and fade to black the Roman Empire will be revived in the final days, a conglomerate of nations, 10 nations to be exact. That's gonna be the vein for the Antichrist to eventually rise through. But when that time happens, the Antichrist is gonna to have to consolidate all power. That's why when you hear somebody talking about a globalist agenda, that is not a conspiracy theory. This is what the Bible says the world is eventually moving towards. One world government, one world economy, one world currency, one world religion. It's all moving in that direction. And guess who's in the way of that plan that is from Lucifer himself? The church of Jesus Christ. Okay. As the chapters unfold, as we've covered, it's like you're zooming in, you're getting more details. Now we're in chapter 11 and we're like right up in the Grecian empire. And we're gonna look at this divide that took place between the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom. And this is what it says. That verses five to 20 are the kings of the North and the kings of the South. The kings of the North are Syria. Syria is a nation in the Middle East right now that is North of Israel. Okay, let's place it on the map. And the kings of the south are the kings that come through the lineage out of Egypt. Egypt is still a nation in the Middle East. So you got Israel tucked between Egypt and Syria. The Seleucus dynasty began with Seleucus I. The Ptolemy dynasty began with Ptolemy I. From this point forward, you're gonna see kings who have children who decide to name their children after themselves. There's gonna be a Ptolemy II, a Ptolemy III, a Seleucus II, a Seleucus III, an Antiochus I, an Antiochus II, an Antiochus the Great, an Antiochus Epiphanes. Don't get lost in the details. Just understand we're gonna follow the thread. Remember the specificity and accuracy of this Bible prophecy is unparalleled. The developments are so specific, which tells me this, nothing is accidental or coincidental that comes from a God who is providential. There's no such thing as accidents. There's no such thing as chance or coincidence. There is just God's providence. From the dying of a sparrow to the dawning of tomorrow, your God controls everything. Does not make us robots. Does not make us inactive in what we call free will. See, God's sovereignty does not negate man's responsibility. You make a bad decision, there'll be bad consequences. You make good decisions, there'll be good consequences. However, man's responsibility cannot circumvent God's sovereignty. See how this works? And on this side of the curtain, I don't need to reconcile all that. I can simply look to the scriptures and trust 
that even a sparrow that falls from the sky, where do you pull that from, pastor? Jesus said it. Jesus said it in terms of persecution. Don't fear those that can touch the body but can't touch the soul. Fear the one who can destroy both, both what? Body, physical man and woman, your body and your soul. Fear the one who has both those and is able to dispose of them. Fear him. And then Jesus wants to encourage them because they're about to be persecuted relentlessly by the Roman Empire. Every disciple would be killed other than John by the hands of government that got too big. Jesus says, aren't two sparrows sold for a copper coin? That was insignificant money. And not a single sparrow falls to the ground apart from your father's will. You wanna talk about an intimate God? You know that squirrel that you drove by on the way to Coastal Christian? You know what I'm talking about? Like that, according to what Jesus just said, did not happen outside of the father's will. Proverbs 19, 21, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. There are many plans but it's God's purpose that will prevail. Proverbs 21, one, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water, he'll turn it whichever way he wills. The king's heart, the emperor's heart, the president's heart, the dictator's heart, the ruler's heart, the mayor's heart. I mean, you name anybody in government and at any level and their hearts in the hands of your God, that should bring you confidence. Your employer, some of you are currently dealing with stuff at work, Pray for your employer's heart. Say, God, their heart is in your hand. Beg your God. Their heart is in your hand, God. You turn it which way, whichever way you will for my good and your glory. Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap. Okay, lot, let's, let's pull straws. Let's, let's cast die. This was all done for two reasons. Chance, right? Let's see how it comes out. This is random but it was also done to honor their gods, plural, right? They believed the gods were somehow in the midst of their decisions. So they were so close to having faith. And the proverb tells me, hey, the lot, which isn't so random after all, that's cast into the lap. I hope it works out. Every decision is from the Lord. Like it doesn't matter how it lands. That's exactly as God wanted it. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, put your spiritual seatbelts on. We're gonna make our way through verses five to 20. Verse five, also the king of the south shall become strong as well as one of his princes and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of her authority and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her and with him who begot her and with him who strengthened her in those times. Okay, a lot just happened there. On the history books, detail after detail from the rise of Ptolemy I to the rise of Seleucus I for them having kids. What happened here in short is that the king of the south, Ptolemy I, and the king of the north, Seleucus I, they become allies. Why? Because they were both generals in Alexander's army. They start out as allies. But they then, of course, because power makes you thirsty, they want to dominate. The only way to bring them back to an alliance is by usage of a daughter. It was not uncommon for the daughter of a king to be given to the daughter of another or to, to the son of another kingdom and have the marriage be the agreement or the alliance between the two. So that was a success, except for the problem that the daughter was named Bernice and she was given to Antiochus II who already had a wife. And because he had to put his wife aside to honor this agreement, in the account, it tells us of conspiring and betrayal and murder and there's a lot of activity here, but in short, Laodicea, which is the wife, she eventually comes back. And she did not like how she was replaced. So she not only kills Bernice, the daughter of Ptolemy, she kills her husband, Antiochus, and even one of their sons, and then replaces on the throne her son. And now you're seeing 
how all of this was prophesied in such detail. You're talking about families that were at odds. You're talking about two kingdoms, the north and the south. You're talking about betrayal and murder. And, it, and we're not done, folks. Verse seven, but from the branch of her roots, that's Bernice, one shall arise in his place. Who's this? This is Bernice's brother. Bernice's brother is gonna come for some revenge against Laodicea. Laodicea now is about to be taken out by Bernice's brother. That's Ptolemy III. He successfully attacks the realm of Seleucus, returns to Egypt with captives and great spoil. That's what it tells us, ready? Who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, deal with them, prevail. He shall carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold. He shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. Is anybody's head spinning yet? I'm telling you, I'm only scratching the tip of the details of this prophecy. Two years later, Seleucus launched an unsuccessful attack against Egypt and verses 10 all the way to verses 17, you're gonna see a seesaw battle back and forth between the kings of the north and the kings of the south, all of which, now here's the point, all of which impacted little old Israel tucked in between because whoever was winning the battles was usually adversarial or opposing against Israel. And this is why God is showing Daniel to warn the people of what's to come. However, his son shall stir up strife, assemble a multitude of great forces. One shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress, stir up strife. The king of the south shall be moved with rage. He shall go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude. But the multitude shall be given into the hand of the enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up. He will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south, also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, that's the Jews, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come and build a siege mound, take a fortified city and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall not have any strength to resist, but he who comes against him shall do according to his own will and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land, that's Israel, with destruction in his power. He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of woman that is a very young girl, given as an alliance, as an agreement to the king of the south. But she shall not stand with him or be with him. Translation, here's what happens. The sons of Seleucus arise. They begin to battle with the kings of the south. That's Egypt. The most notable son from Seleucus is Antiochus the Great. Antiochus the Great, he leads this great conquest and eventually finds himself between a rock and a hard place with the eventual rise of the Romans at this time. The Romans are now asking Antiochus the Great to pay tribute. He doesn't have the money. He goes back into his own hometown and he tries to plunder the temple. He dies in that insurrection. They eventually use a young girl to bring an alliance. Her name's Cleopatra. She's not the famed Cleopatra of Egypt. She is like one of the original Cleopatras. We eventually get to that famous Cleopatra. This marriage brings these two kingdoms together, but it doesn't work. Because once she's married, she eventually sides with Egypt. So it all falls apart. And here we go, the final three verses. After this, he shall turn his face to the coastlands. He shall take many but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. And with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. Therefore shall arise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, that's Israel. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. This is Antiochus III. He attempted to conquer Greece. He was defeated by the Romans at Thermopylae and Magnesia. He returned to his own land, died in an insurrection. His successor, Seleucus III, became infamous for his oppressive taxes on Israel. He died mysteriously, perhaps by poisoning. And this is what gave rise to Antiochus Epiphanes, the foreshadow of the Antichrist. Okay, that was a lot. And like I said, all of those details 
can be given in a commentary that I would love to provide that has, it will, if you're a history buff and you reach out to me, I'll make sure that you can read through all the things that I did not cover. But I said all that to say this. <laughs> like literally, that was the introduction. And this is what I have to say. Trust me, I don't, I don't, I don't enjoy that type of exposition through the word. That it, it's a lot. There's a lot of things happening, but I wanted to go backwards before we go forward. Because in Daniel chapter two, this is what Daniel said as he was given the vision to interpret the dream from King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. Now, if you're wondering what was on the screen previous, it was just lines from all of those verses. And the reason I pulled out all those lines is because they all lend themselves to God's sovereignty. You're talking about the expansion of a kingdom, that's God. You're talking about the longevity of a certain king in a certain area, that's God. You're talking about having offspring and given as agreements, that's God. God is behind the scenes working all of this out. Daniel earlier understood it's God who removes the king. It's God who replaces the king. We have to have an understanding that God is in all of this. He wasn't done, even in Daniel chapter four. Remember, this is the chapter of humiliation for Nebuchadnezzar. He's warned a watcher or an angel tells him that he's gonna go through this great humiliation and here's the lesson God wanted him to know. Nebuchadnezzar was known as the king of kings, king of probably one of the greatest empires, the Babylonian empire in wealth and probably in vastness. And this is what the watcher said, Daniel 4, 17, in order that the living, that's us, may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, that's us, he gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. That exact phraseology is reiterated a few verses later by Daniel. Daniel's like, this is happening because God wants you to know that he rules in the dominion of man. And it's said again by the voice from heaven in verse 32, same thing. God gives it to whomever he will. He wants you to know he rules in the kingdom of men. And then finally, at the end of chapter four, King Nebuchadnezzar says this, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. That's us. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can say to God, what are you doing? No one can turn their fists to the heaven and say, why did you allow this? No one can say, where are you in all of this? No, 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 that's not the right question. What have you done? The right and proper biblical question is, what have we done? What have we done to get ourselves in this mess in 2021? What has the church of Jesus Christ, those that wear the name, who don't bear the nature, who are in the church, but not of the church, and I'm guilty as charged for not carrying forth the gospel of Jesus Christ in such a passionate way that I'm taking the ground back that the enemy has subtly taken over the past several decades. What have we done in allowing prayer to be kicked out of the public square? What have we done that has allowed Bible teaching, which is the formation and foundation of our nation, to be completely removed from the public square? What have we done to allow Roe v. Wade in 1973 to be the law of the land where it is now legal to get a free abortion? What have we done? And whether you know this or not, that exact case failed in four other courts before it made its way to the Supreme Court. Why? Because the enemy is relentless and we sit off on the sidelines and God gives us exactly how it's gonna unfold. And we're unwilling to address the times that we are living in. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak 
is to speak, not to act, is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. There is an enemy that is coming after our children. And yes, the current administration may be godless, but they are still being used by the administration of God. You understand what that means? It means in a very real sense of judgment and a very real sense of prophetic alignment. The current administration from the domestic policies to the foreign policies, domestic, they are destroying the fabric of our land, whether you wanna admit it or not. And they're doing so by one pillar and institution at a time. And they've been patient and the enemy has been working overtime as of late. And if you don't have eyes to see it, I do not know what else to say from the pulpit. I really have no more words to explain to you that you are asleep. If you're offended by the word of God, it's not because of the way it's being administered, it's because you have chosen the wrong side. Amen. 1.3 million undocumented and illegal immigrants have entered our country in the past year. That is unprecedented. And no, I am not against immigration. Our country was built upon legal immigration. You're talking about an administration who is not testing people for COVID in the middle of a pandemic, letting them come in in droves. But here they are focused more on masking our children. They wanna put masks on our children, which not only psychologically does damage, it doesn't physically do anything to prevent anyone from getting coronavirus. Yeah, I said it. And it needs to be said. And that is not an indictment. If you choose to wear a mask, wear your mask. There's not an indictment. If you choose to get the vax, get the vax. But if you can't see there's an agenda that is currently sweeping our country and our world, you have blinders on. And too many people like an ostrich with their head in the sand are avoiding the obvious. Judgment comes in a land that completely forsakes God. And we've done that. We have replaced the confession of sin with the complete outright celebration of sin. We are under judgment. And I, ho I hate to break it to you that way, but God is still up to something in the midst of judgment. How do I know that? Because Israel's name means governed by God. And because they chose to remove God and replace God, God gave them over to judgment. That is why Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon came and swallowed them. And that is why Daniel is even in Babylon in the first place. But God does not allow anyone rise to power without bringing judgment upon them. And he then raises up Cyrus, the Persians, and he punishes Babylon. And here we are in our context, and I'm wondering how God's raising up different things happening to punish us. But the punishment has two purposes, punishment for the deviant, those that are reprobate, those that are degenerate, those that are going to continue to follow the prince of the power of the air, and for the church and the Christian, anybody that calls out on the name of Jesus, it's refinement, refinement for the remnant. He is literally giving us eyes to see what side of this equation we're on, and it's not right or left. It's about what is right or wrong. It's very clear Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. All the nations, it is embedded in every nation and every type of people from the beginning of time to give God glory. Romans one said, no man is without excuse. No one. And then we jump to Romans 13. Yeah, but Romans 13 pastor says that we should submit to the authorities. And I go, keep reading. It says the authorities are put in place as appointments as ministers of God's justice. And their role and goal is to define good as God defines it and honor it and punish evil as God defines it and deal with it. And that is how you keep stability in a society. That's God's government. But here's what happens, ladies and gentlemen, every institution, whether a schoolhouse or the White House forfeits their divine appointment when they begin to contradict God's divine design behind government. So you don't submit to what God calls woe. What do you mean? 
Isaiah 520, scripture reconciles scripture. I don't submit to a godless government when Isaiah 520 says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. So how are you telling me I'm supposed to submit to a godless government and godless policies in the name of Romans chapter 13 because it says submit to that? And no, 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 you don't understand the scriptures. There is an enemy that is currently at war with the kingdom of God. The foreign policies, have you any understanding what's happening? The current administration has entered into renegotiation with the Iran nuclear deal. That will give Iran nuclear capabilities. That is a terroristic country, ladies and gentlemen, that calls America the white devil. Not to mention the Afghani debacle where we left billions of dollars of weaponry. And if you didn't know, while that's happening, we completely equipped a terroristic Taliban who was responsible for the terroristic attacks and hiding Al-Qaeda, which was our 9-11. If you didn't know, while that was happening, there are people in what we call the House of Representatives that were trying to remove the funding to Israel's Iron Dome, which is their weaponry system that protects them from Hamas and all these other terrorists that are firing missiles at them. If it affects Israel, ladies and gentlemen, it affects the United States. If it affects the United States, it affects Israel. Not to mention, Lieutenant Colonel Schurler decided to speak up about it, call out some top level officials asking for accountability. I'm in the military, he said. I know how this goes. I'm just demanding accountability and integrity. You know what they did? They put a gag order on him. Here's a man living with integrity who's bold enough to speak against the establishment because it's the right thing to do. And you know what they do? This is our State Department. They respond with a gag order and then they incarcerate him. And now his parents are calling for aid and prayer and help. And here you have a State Department, whether you know this or not, who was stopping NGOs, non-governmental organizations, like my friend Victor Marks from going into Afghanistan and pulling out, not ladies and gentlemen, somebody stand behind a teleprompter and saying, there's only about 100 people that we've left in Afghanistan and we're trying to get everybody out. There's thousands of people left over there, Afghani civilians and even Americans that are stranded in Afghanistan while our State Department stopped all these NGOs from going in and aiding and assisting and getting our own civilians back home. That's happening while we're sitting in this church, there's a godless administration that is completely destroying our country. Not to mention the New START Treaty, which is actually started by President Obama, which gives Russia, another one of our enemies, complete access to more money. We've re-entered the Paris Climate Accords, which emboldens China, North Korea, China, Iran, Syria, Iraq, and little old Israel, the people of God. And the Bible is very clear about blessing Israel. The Bible is very clear about anyone who curses Israel. The Bible is very clear about all prophecies that rise and fall based on little old Israel. And those governed by God, the God that I love, the God that I serve, the God that I want to represent, those governed by that God have always been a threat to godless governments. The bigger government gets, the more rights they take from you and I. Godless governments seek to be God. Did you know that? And what do you think the first thing a godless government that's seeking to be the highest power, seeking to be God, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to take your God-given rights. And they're seeking to take your rights. And if you, there's coming a day where in our country, it will be considered a hate crime to address moral issues. And that's why the Canadian pastor, Artur Pulowski, was just in our country warning us of what's happening to the land of the North. He was in our country the past three months literally saying, wake up, it's coming your way. So what they do, they put a warrant out for his arrest. Why? Because he was having church in Canada and he baptized his daughter. So he could have stayed over here, but he said, I'm going home because I wanna be in alignment with what I'm telling people to be about. I'm gonna go face the consequences. As soon as he got off the plane, guess who was waiting for him? Police. Yep. Calgary police. 
putting a man of the book in handcuffs and taking him for the possibility of a six-year prison sentence. You want to talk about the global agenda called 2030, Davos 2030? The World Economic Forum is putting it out. It's called the Great Reset. They're no longer even hiding their cards. They're actually putting it all out there. They're calling it stakeholder capitalism. That is, that is global socialism. That's exa- hey, you will own nothing and you will be happy. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. He is literally consolidating power. He's consolidating power because there's no other way for him to be able to reign unless he's been given all that authority. And because I represent the kingdom of heaven as an ambassador on earth, I understand my rights and my responsibilities come from God. No man can take them. I'm gonna speak and preach truth until the Lord calls me home. Because if the Bible I'm reading is true, if Christ is truly risen, then we are commissioned to hold the line of truth on this side of heaven. And those who truly know their calling They will not fall for the lies of Babylon because they know one day Babylon will be fallen. See, God is in control from the falling of a sparrow to the dawning of tomorrow. Every king, every kingdom will eventually be overthrown except for those that submit to the one true throne. And the one true throne has a king sitting upon it and his name's Jesus. And because his throne is sovereign over all, I can trust him with my tomorrow. There is no throne, no dominion, no power, no principality, no authority outside of the God of scripture. So there are godless governments, but do you know the government of your God and what he's called you to?